So, just to recall what we saw in the last lecture, we have D uh, uh, inside the complex plane, uh, D is a simply connected domain. And of course, D is not uh, the whole complex plane, okay. So, so you know there is a point A uh, uh, in the complex plane which is outside D, okay. And if you look at the function Z minus A, uh, uh, this is analytic and uh, never 0. On D because the point A is outside D, all right. And uh, you know, uh, if you have a non-zero analytic function on a simply connected domain, then uh, you can get an analytic branch of the log of that function. Okay. So you know. So basically, if you want, you know, uh, your domain. Uh, I'm just drawing a picture. All that I know about the domain is that it is. Uh, it's simply connected. Uh, and it is not the whole complex plane okay. But what I am drawing here is uh, something that is bounded it need not be like this right. Uh, for example it could be the upper half plane right which is unbounded. But I am drawing a diag uh, I am drawing this diagram so that you uh, just for uh, uh, some motivation. So the point A is in the complex plane minus uh, uh, the set D. So you know if I take a point uh, z then I am I am looking at z minus a which is translation by minus a alright z minus a f of z equal to z minus a uh, is uh, just translation by minus a so it is a Mobius transformation actually okay. So it translates uh, uh, this whole disc uh, by minus a alright. Uh, but that is not what I want what I want to say is that uh, Z minus A uh, has an analytic branch uh, uh, that is a, an analytic branch of the log of Z minus A here and how do I do that you see I take a point I fix a point Z naught in D alright and you know and you give me any other point Z in D alright take any path gamma alright then you define you, you know if you integrate along gamma. Uh, uh, I am trying to find an analytic branch of log of Z minus A okay. Uh, what is its derivative? Derivative of log of Z minus A is 1 by Z minus A alright. So the integral of that should give me the log right. Therefore I integrate over gamma okay uh, D is D uh, is Z by Z minus A okay when I do this. So gamma is from Z0 to Z then what I will get is a logarithm of Z minus A okay and uh, you know you, you, if I I will get logs see in fact what I will get is log Z minus A uh, final point minus log Z minus A initial point okay. So in fact so you know this is this, this is this is independent of gamma this this integral is independent of the path okay and that is because of simple connectedness because you know if I instead of gamma if I put another take another path gamma prime which is also inside D alright then you know since D is simply connected then uh, gamma can be uh, the, the integral over gamma followed by minus gamma prime which is a loop will be 0 for the function 1 by Z minus A because 1 by Z minus A will be analytic in D that is because Z minus A never vanishes in D. And by Cauchy's theorem, this integral will be zero. Okay, so this is independent of gamma, 
and this is what this is just going to be log of z minus a uh, minus log of uh, z not minus a this is up the, the, the indefinite integral is log of z minus a the upper limit is z the lower limit is z not this is what you are going to get and therefore you know if I if so if I if I take this plus this I will get an analytic branch of log of z minus a so so in other words you know uh, integral over gamma uh, so I will just write this integral over gamma as z not to z dz by z minus a plus log of z not minus a is an analytic branch of log of z minus a in d okay is an analytic branch branch of log z minus a in d so you see i've used i've used uh, you know i've used uh, cauchy's theorem i've used uh, if you want i've used morera's theorem all right i used everything here okay to say that the integral is independent of the path i need integral over a closed loop is zero and integral over a closed loop is zero because the integrand is 1 by z minus a is analytic z and that is because z minus a never vanishes okay and therefore by cauchy's theorem integral over gamma is the same as integral over gamma prime therefore this integral is independent of the path all right and then uh, uh, and then of course uh, uh, the derivative of this which uh, follows from uh, uh, you know uh, the proof of Morera's theorem that uh, if you differentiate this uh, as an indefinite integral you will get log of z z minus a all right and therefore this log of z minus a when I write log of z minus a it is some branch of the logarithm which is not uh, just continuous but it is actually even analytic the analyticity comes from uh, observing the proof of Morera's theorem okay. So what will happen is that uh, this expression here will be an analytic branch of the logarithm and uh, so that is the reason why I am writing log but I am not uh, it is some branch you do not know what branch it is but it is some branch right but it is analytic that is the most most important thing. So I have an analytic branch of the logarithm and once I have analytic branch of the logarithm what I have is I can uh, 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 so, so I may let, let me again tell you I have used the fact that d the domain d is not is not the whole complex plane because I have chosen a point outside d okay if the domain d is the whole complex plane I do not have a point outside it okay I cannot do this so I have used the fact that the domain d is smaller than the complex plane then I have used the fact that the domain d is simply connected because if a domain is simply connected then any loop uh, if you take any loop inside the domain the region inside that loop will also be inside that domain because the domain cannot have any holes okay and I need uh, I need all the region inside this loop formed by gamma and the reverse of gamma gamma prime to be inside the domain because only then I can apply Cauchy's theorem to say that the integral over gamma is equal to the integral over gamma prime all right therefore uh, the moral of the story is that I have used simply connectedness of the domain I used the fact that the domain is not the whole complex plane I have used both I have used both all right okay so now now this is so I have yeah, I have an analytic branch of log uh, 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 z minus a here all right now I can I can define h of z to be an analytic branch of root of z minus a okay uh, analytic branch branch of uh, uh, root of z minus a and how do I define it it is very simple this is just exponential of half log z minus a okay so I already have an analytic branch of log z minus a I multiply it by half and take e to the raise it uh, raise e to that power and I will get an analytic function and this analytic function is just root of z minus a okay because you know this if you think of it this half will go to the power here and the e and log will cancel and I will get z minus a to the half okay. So 
this is an analytic branch of the square root function okay and now uh, I want to uh, I want you to uh, understand that this has some properties so first thing I want to say is that you see so you see since it is an analytic branch of z minus a you will have uh, z h squared of z will be z minus a so in other words you will have z equal to uh, h squared of z plus a I will get this alright and from this I want to uh, 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 derive two properties of h namely the first property is that h is 1 to 1 and the second property is that uh, the image of h the image of d under h and minus of h they are the images are disjoint okay okay so but before I continue let me try to say what I am trying to do I see what is the Riemann mapping theorem Riemann mapping theorem is you know give me a domain d which is simply connected and which is not the whole complex plane then it is conformally equivalent to the unit disc that is the Riemann mapping theorem so I have to find from the domain d I have to find a Riemann map f okay I have to find a Riemann map f which goes into the unit disc delta this is a set of all uh, uh, complex numbers with modulus less than 1 okay so I, I have to find uh, I have I have to find a map into this okay from this domain into this I have to find a map f which is analytic which is 1 to 1 okay and whose for which you also have an inverse okay which is also analytic in other words I want to find an analytic isomorphism of this domain d into the uh, onto the unit disc that is the Riemann mapping theorem okay that is what I want to do but what I am trying to do now in the first step is try to at least map this disc into a smaller possibly smaller domain inside the unit disc that is what I am going to do in the first step first I will show that you can map this d into a smaller uh, domain inside the unit disc okay and then I am going to use that and, 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 and some more techniques to show that you know you can that from that and using some analysis you can you can get a map which maps this not just inside the unit disc but onto the unit disc okay so you can you can use some analytic techniques to show that you can uh, this instead of this map you can find another map for which uh, I mean which which covers the whole unit disc okay so the first step is you are just mapping this into a smaller domain inside the unit disc like this okay and what is that map and that map is going to be cooked up using h okay that is the importance of h so so let me so let me make these claims that I said some time ago h is 1 to 1 h is 1 to 1 on d why is it 1 to 1 on d because you know h of z1 is equal to h of z2 on d means well you put it here you will get z1 is equal to h squared z1 plus a but hz1 is hz2 so it is h squared z2 plus a but that is equal to z2 okay so hz1 equal to hz2 means z1 equal to z2 which means it is 1 to 1 okay so your uh, map h is analytic and 1 to 1 okay but what do you know about an 1 to 1 analytic map it is an isomorphism okay we have seen this uh, uh, we have seen this inverse function theorem if you have 1 to 1 analytic mapping it is already an uh, isomorphism onto the image okay an analytic a non constant analytic mapping is always an open map mind you if you take a 1 to 1 analytic map then its image is open and on the image you can define the inverse you can define the inverse because it is a 1 to 1 function but the inverse function theorem will tell you that the inverse will also be analytic therefore a 1 to 1 analytic map is an analytic isomorphism it is a holomorphic isomorphism or conformal isomorphism therefore what this will tell you is that h from d to h of d h from d to h of d will be a holomorphic isomorphism okay so uh, thus h from d to h of d is a holomorphic isomorphism of course uh, 
the other words that are used are uh, well in the literature people instead of saying holomorphic isomorphism people say analytic isomorphism or they use conformal isomorphism or some people sometimes use the word conformal conformally equivalent okay. So this is this is because of the open mapping theorem and inverse function theorem okay. Now so you know so the point is well here is my D and then I have this H uh, so so of course uh, whether there exists an F like this is uh, is the question that is the Riemann mapping theorem but I am looking at D and here is HD this is some domain some other domain uh, uh, it is another domain okay and then I can also look at minus HD okay minus HD is uh, consists of all those complex numbers whose negatives are in HD okay. So well in other in, in other words you know minus HD will be just reflection of HD so if I draw a diagram well uh, I need to draw let me do this so here is my point A somewhere outside uh, let me save some space here and here I will draw the unit disc. Uh, and and well so if I draw this a little bigger my situation is like this uh, here is a complex target complex plane and uh, well this complex plane uh, this complex plane here is the W plane is the Z plane and uh, and here is a W plane and uh, I am I am using the map uh, w is equal to h of z where h is a square analytic branch of this root of z minus a and you know well uh, the image of d under h is going to be something well uh, so let me draw something here. So this is hd okay it is some it is some domain in the complex plane okay mind you HD is uh, isomorphic to D therefore it will also have the properties of D namely it will be a domain and it will be simply connected. So H of D will also be a simply connected domain alright and uh, and what is minus HD it is just the reflection of HD so I, I will have this minus of HD alright I have the map minus H see if, if H is analytic then minus H is also analytic H, if H is analytic then minus h is also analytic and in fact uh, uh, minus h will give you the other uh, branch okay uh, if h is one branch of root z minus a minus h will give you the other branch because you will always get two branches for the square root you will have two branches for the nth root you will have nth bra n branches. So if you take minus h it will be the other branch analytic branch of the square root and h and minus h will be uh, mirror reflections of each other under the real axis and the, the, the claim is that h and minus h cannot intersect okay h no point of h can belong to minus h I need this fact. So here is one more claim uh, h of d intersection minus h of d is the null set there is no point in h and minus h okay where minus h means uh, the reflection of h so minus h if you want to write it as sets minus h of d is a set of all uh, minus of h of z where z belongs to d okay you just apply minus h instead of h and you know if h is analytic on d minus h is also analytic on d an analytic function defined by I mean an analytic function multiplied by an by a constant is also an analytic function after all minus h is h multiplied by minus 1 minus 1 is a constant therefore minus h is also an analytic function right. Now you see what I want to say is that there is no point common to both of this okay so so you know if uh, there is a point common to both of this let me try to get a contradiction then it means that w0 is h of z z0 and it is also equal to h of well I let me use z1 
and is also equal to h of z2 minus h of z2 for z1 and z2 in d this is what it means to say that uh, there is a point common to h of d and minus h of d so this there is so if you call that point as w0 then there is a z1 in d which is mapped by h into w0 and there is a z2 in d which is mapped by minus h into w0 okay and well this cannot happen why this cannot happen is, is, is just a simple calculation because you know now I can use I can I can start I can use the same kind of calculation here I will get z1 is equal to h squared z1 plus a and uh, uh, but you see h hz1 is minus hz2 therefore h squared z1 is the same as h squared z2 so this is equal to h squared z2 plus a and and that is equal to uh, z that is equal to z2 okay see whether you take h or minus h whether you take h or minus h h squared is always z minus a because both h and minus h are two branches of the square root both h and minus h are branches of root of z minus a so h squared is always z minus a okay so I am using that here so I will get z1 equal to z2 okay but if z1 is equal to z2 then it means h of z1 is equal to h of z2 okay so this implies h of z1 is equal to h of z2 but h of z1 is also equal to minus of h of z2 so what this will tell you is that it will tell you that h of z2 is 0 okay but what is h of z2 after all is the h of z2 is minus w0 so minus w0 is 0 this will tell you that w0 is 0 okay but then that will mean that h of see uh, but this cannot happen you know because see w0 cannot be 0 that is a contradiction because w0 is a value of h or minus h and also it is also a value of h and it is also a value of minus h but just use the fact that it is a value of h w0 is a value of h but h is what h is an exponential the exponential function can never take the value 0 therefore it is a contradiction so uh, contradiction as h is not equal to 0 that is because h is exponential the exponential function ne can never take the value 0 okay therefore if you assume that uh, there is a point in the in, in the intersection of hd and minus hd you get a contradiction okay so so this implies that hd and uh, minus hd uh, they do not intersect their intersection is null set is an null set okay so the diagram is the, the diagram is really like this hd and its section they do not meet each other they do not intersect and now why do I need this I need this for the following reason see if I take a point w0 let me choose a point w0 in uh, in the image and choose a small disc uh, centered at w0 which is in the image so this is a disc uh, mod, mod w minus w0 less than or equal to epsilon I take a small disc closed disc in the image okay uh, then let us see what happens if mod w minus w0 less than or equal to epsilon is in hd okay then you see uh, uh, where where of course you know w0 is h of z0 okay so I mean I take this point z0 and uh, it goes to a point w0 and I take a small enough disc closed disc which is in hd okay centered at w0 radius epsilon okay then uh, the distance of h of z uh, then the distance of minus hz from w0 is greater than epsilon you see for all z in d 
see try to understand the statement see you take any z in d okay then hz is going to lie in hd okay but if i take minus hd hz it is going to lie in minus hd okay so you know he, hz is going to lie here minus hz is going to lie here therefore the distance of minus hz from w not has to be certainly greater than epsilon okay because if the distance of minus hz for some z if the distance of minus hz uh, to w not is lesser than uh, uh, epsilon then that point will be an intersection of hd and minus hd which is not possible okay therefore you get this fact okay and this this that is in other words what you will get is if you write it uh, the distance between two complex numbers is given by taking the modulus of the dif difference so it will give you that minus hz minus w not is greater than epsilon for all z in d so you get modulus of hz plus w not is greater than epsilon for all z in d you get this okay now you know now you put f of z to be uh, epsilon by hz plus w not put f of z equal to epsilon by hz plus w0 if you do this then this is analytic this is analytic which is analytic on d see this is analytic on d because you know uh, uh, hz plus w0 uh, this is always greater than epsilon okay therefore it never vanishes so 1 by hz plus Eps, uh, uh, sorry hz plus w0 is always greater than epsilon and epsilon is positive so his modulus of uh, H, hz plus w0 uh, is greater than epsilon which is positive and doesn't vanish so that means hz plus w0 never uh, never vanishes so 1 by hz plus w0 is an analytic function and i have multiplied it by an epsilon on the numerator so this is an analytic function and what's more this is actually this is even uh, one to one analytic function because after all what I have done is I have taken the one to one function h I have translated by w0 because translation is also a bilinear transformation it is analytic and it is uh, one to one and then I have then I have inverted it then I have multiplied by epsilon okay so I have applied a series of Mobius transformations to h okay to get from how do I get f from h first I take h and translate by w0 that is a translation okay so I translate by w0 then I invert okay I apply the transformation w going to 1 by w an inversion which is also a Mobius transformation okay then I multi then I multiply by epsilon and multiplying by a complex number is also a Mobius transformation so I get h f from h by applying uh, 3 by composing with 3 Mobius transformations therefore since h is 1 to 1 f will also be 1 to 1 so f will also be a 1 to 1 analytic map on d but the beautiful thing is now f will land inside the unit disk okay clear uh, clearly f is analytic and 1 1 1 to 1 on the unit disk uh, I mean on d and what is mod f set mod fz is going to be epsilon by mod of hz plus w0 which is less than 1 because of this inequality this inequality tells you that epsilon by mod of hz plus w0 is equal to 1 is strictly less than 1 so I will get mod fz less than 1 what does it mean it means that f takes values in the unit disk okay thus f gives a holomorphic isomorphism isomorphism from uh, d on to f d which is contained in the unit disc delta which is a set of all sets z mod z less than 1 okay 
if you want I can put W because the okay. So, what we have done so far is we have just used the uh, existence of square root of uh, uh, z minus a to derive that you can find an analytic map which goes which maps the domain D uh, isomorphically onto a subdomain of the unit disc. So, it lands here this is the unit disc okay. So, there exists an analytic isomorphism of the domain D onto a, a subdomain of the unit disc the subdomain is F D this is the unit disc delta and this contains the subdomain which is F of D and F from D to F of D is an analytic isomorphism because it is analytic and one to one alright. So, this is the first step this is the first step that using which you can map any simply connected domain which is not the whole complex plane onto a smaller domain in the unit disc what we want is we want a map that will fill the whole unit disc okay that is the main thing. So, uh, so the moral of the story is that somehow you have to show that if you give me a map uh, if you give me a simply connected domain uh, inside the unit disc okay you have to somehow show that that is uh, also equivalent to the unit disc okay. I have to somehow show uh, I have to uh, somehow show that a simply connected subdomain of the unit disc is also conformally or holomorphically equivalent to the unit disc that is what I have to do. So, this so what we have done is we have translated the problem for an arbitrary simply connected domain which is not the whole complex plane to a problem of looking at a simply connected subdomain of the unit disc which is not the whole unit disc okay. So, the so the this step reduces to st studying everything inside the unit disc okay. So, what it tells you is that you have to study the unit disc carefully and that is what we are going to do in the, uh, in the in the following discussion what we are going to do is we are going to study geometry on the unit disc a very special geometry called the hyperbolic geometry on the unit disc okay. So, it, it this leads us to study the hyperbolic geometry on the unit disc. So, uh, so let me write that down hyperbolic geometry on the unit disc So, you know uh, we already know uh, uh, we already know some facts about the unit disc. So, what are the couple of facts that we know about the unit disc we know one one fact that we know is Schwarz's lemma okay and the other thing is the corollary of the Schwarz lemma which says that any automorphism of the unit disc a holomorphic automorphism of the unit disc that fixes the origin has to be a rotation okay. So, let us let us recall that Schwarz's lemma. So, what is Schwarz lemma f from delta to delta bar analytic and f is defined on the unit disc and takes values in the inside the closed unit disc f takes 0 to 0 okay. Then uh, Schwarz lemma says that the dis the length of f z cannot exceed the length of z for all z in the unit disc for all z in the unit disc this is Schwarz's lemma and it tells you that you get equality for a single non-zero uh, member of, uh, of the unit disc if and only if it is a rotation further equality mod f z naught is equal to mod z naught for even a single z naught not equal to 0 with mod z naught less than 1 implies f of z is a rotation. A rotation okay and and it is not only that it implies it is if and only if okay. 
So you have equality uh, even for a single vector if the image uh, of that vector I mean for, uh, if you think of the point as a vector uh, in the complex plane the vector joining with the origin to that point the position vector of that point okay. Then if the length of the vector is equal to the length of its image even for one point then your analytic map has to be a rotation there is no other choice okay. So this is the Schwarz lemma and here is a corollary and the corollary is the set of automorphisms the holomorphic automorphisms of delta so this is a set of all uh, maps from delta to delta which are holomorphic isomorphisms they are in other words they are injective holomorphic maps uh, they are bijective holomorphic maps from delta to delta and you know bijective holomorphic map is automatically a holomorphic isomorphism because of the inverse function theorem and the open mapping theorem therefore this is a set of automorphisms of the unit disc and what are they they are just rotations okay. So in fact the point is I uh, will uh, come back to it soon but here we are only looking at automorphisms which fix the origin okay. So let me put let me write delta comma 0 this is the set of all these are all the rotations. So this is just the set of all z going to e to the i alpha z. and uh, so and that is that can be identified with the uh, each rotation therefore is given by this angle alpha <laughs> okay. So you can identify it with just uh, the unit circle S1 which is the boundary of the unit disc every point of S1 has a unique angle alpha namely the angle joining that point to the origin made with the x axis the real axis and therefore uh, the set of holomorphic automorphisms is just S1 and this so what is the map you send any holomorphic automorphism is of the form z going to e to the i alpha z and you send z going to e I you send this map z going to e to the i alpha z to the element e to the i alpha which is on the unit circle which is the boundary of the unit disc okay that gives you a bijection and this is not just a bijection okay it is actually it is actually a group isomorphism because if you compose two rotations the angles will get added okay and therefore on the circle also uh, the uh, you have uh, uh, the set of all complex numbers of modulus 1 is also a group e power i alpha and e power i beta when you multiply you will get e power i alpha plus beta. So this uh, this bijection is not just a bijection of sets it is even a bijection of groups okay. So the group of what holomorphic automorphisms of the unit disc which fix the origin can be identified with the unit circle as a group under multiplication okay. This we have seen that this is a corollary of the Schwarz lemma right. So these are the first two facts now uh, uh, the whole point about hyper hyperbolic geometry comes from what is called hyperbolic uh, the hyperbolic metric on the uh, on the unit disc and the hyperbolic metric uh, that that you have a nice hyperbolic metric uh, which is preserved by all these uh, holomorphic automorphisms of the unit disc okay now that itself comes from something that is called uh, Pick's lemma which is a kind of uh, nice version of Schwarz lemma okay. So, uh, so let so let me make one more statement here I have looked at all the automorphisms holomorphic automorphisms of the unit disc with the origin fixed okay the origin going to the origin but what about any automorphism of the unit disc what are what is a general automorphism of the unit disc. So let me write that so here is a lemma so the lemma is uh, automorphisms any holomorphic automorphism of unit disc what is it it is of the form z going to e power i alpha into z minus z naught by 1 minus z naught bar z where 
where of course alpha is a where alpha is an angle between 0 to 2 pi uh, and uh, z0 uh, is a complex number with modulus less than 1. So here is a lemma this lemma tells you what are all the holomorphic automorphisms of the unit disc what are all the one to one analytic maps of the unit disc onto itself a general map is of this type and you get this case when you put z0 equal to 0 you take you put z0 equal to 0 this expression will become z and the I will get the map z equal z going to e to the i alpha z which is just a rotation about the origin ok. More generally if you if you if your automorphism of the unit disc does not fix the origin it may map origin to something else then it has to look like this ok this is the statement and what is the proof of this well the proof of this is uh, that um, well see if you look at if you look at the map z going to z minus z0 by 1 minus z0 bar z if you look at this map okay then this map uh, mind you this map is a mobius transformation okay this map is a mobius transformation because you see uh, it is of the form see it is of the form z going to a z plus b by c z plus d where a is 1 b is minus z0 c is 1 c is uh, minus z0 bar and d is uh, 1 and if you calculate ad minus bc you are going to get 1 minus bc is going to be uh, uh, z0 z0 bar so I am going to get 1 minus mod, mod z0 squared and that is in fact that is uh, uh, that is greater than 0 because mod z0 is less than 1 since mod z0 is less than 1 mod z0 squared is also less, less than 1 and therefore this is a positive number. So uh, this is of the form z going to a z plus b by c z plus d with a d minus b c non 0 in fact a d minus b c is positive. So it is a Mobius transformation and you know a Mobius transformation is a uh, it is a bijective map of the extended complex plane to the extended complex plane it will always map you know the properties of Mobius transformations namely it will map straight lines and circles onto straight lines and circles on the complex plane but even a straight line on the complex plane can be thought of as a circle on the extended complex plane therefore if you make the statement for the extended complex plane uh, it will always map circles to circles okay and it will map the interior of the circle uh, the interiors and exteriors it will preserve because of continuity okay. So, uh, now what you must understand is that if I if I calculate if I if I take the image of uh, if I take z equal to e power i theta okay and calculate of ca uh, uh, calculate mod z minus z0 I will get mod e power i theta minus z0 but this is equal to its the modulus of its conjugate okay which is equal to e power minus i theta minus z0 bar alright and that is equal to if I multiply throughout by e, e power i theta which I can do because of uh, because the modulus of e power i theta is always 1 what I will end up with is modulus of 1 minus z0 bar e power i theta okay right and that is uh, just 1 minus z0 bar z mod. So what this tells you is that mod z is equal to 1 uh, is mapped onto mod omega equal to 1. So it takes unit circle to the unit circle so if I if you call this as omega as z minus z0 by 1 minus z0 bar z if you put z equal to e to the i theta then mod omega turns out to be 1. So in other words mod z equal to 1 goes to mod omega equal to 1 so this Mobius transformation maps the unit circle to the unit circle after all it is a Mobius transformation so it has to map a circle to a line or a circle but here what it is doing this calculation actually shows that it is mapping the unit circle to the unit circle okay and what about the point 0 0 goes to 
when I put z equal to uh, if I put you know, let, let me not put z, uh, 0 let me put z0 where does z0 go, go to z0 will go to 0 if I substitute z0 I will get 0. So but where is z0 z0 is inside the unit circle okay this z0 is inside the source unit circle and 0 is inside the target unit circle therefore this will tell you that the interior of the unit circle will also go to the interior of the unit circle see what is happening is that you have on the z plane you have the unit circle this is z plane you have the unit circle and on the omega plane also you have the unit circle and you know the unit circle on the z plane goes to the unit circle on the omega plane because of this calculation under the map z going to w or omega given by z minus z0 by 1 minus z0 bar z once your Mobius transformation maps a circle onto a circle then there are only two choices the interior of the circle can either go to the interior of this circle or the interior of the circle will go to the exterior of that circle that is the only possibility but uh, what I am saying is there is if you take the point z0 here which is inside the circle that is going to the origin so the point in the interior of the circle is going to a point in the interior of this circle therefore what this will tell you by property of Mobius transformations is that this whole unit disc is going to be mapped to the unit disc. So what this will tell you is that uh, z going to w equal to z minus z0 bar by 1 minus z0 bar z maps the unit disc into the unit onto the unit disc okay. So it is a holomorphic automorphism of the unit disc it is a holomorphic automorphism of the unit disc and then you know if I take if I take if I multiply it by e power i alpha e power i alpha is only a rotation okay and a rotation will just map the unit disc back onto itself alright therefore if I take this um, uh, 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 map of this form it is certainly a holomorphic automorphism of the unit disc okay implies z going to e power i alpha z minus z0 bar by 1 minus z0 z minus z0 sorry this should be z minus z0 by 1 minus z0 bar z is an element of the holomorphic automorphism of the unit disc. So what I have proved is that this is contained in this I have proved that any element like this is certainly a holomorphic automorphism of the unit disc conversely I have to show any holomorphic automorphism in unit disc is like that and for that I will use this corollary okay I will just use this corollary to show that I will continue later because I just have to compose by suitable transformation of this type and apply Schwarz lemma okay. <coughs>